we now take you to the broadcast of It's Time with Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. Here is Reverend Martin. Thank you, Dr. Blackwell. Let me say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, but never good night and never ever goodbye. I hate goodbyes from a child. I'll explain that one of these years, one of these days. My name is Pastor Nathaniel Wayne Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life Institutional Baptist Church here in Los Angeles, California. We are worshiping. We are located at uh, 8916 South Main Street here in the city of Los Angeles, 8916 South Main, uh, zip code 9003. And uh, we're worshiping with the Shiloh Missionary Christian Church, my good friend, uh, Pastor Dr. Della F. Hollinus, uh, two churches in the one location. I always say you get a double dose of the Holy Ghost when you come by, because uh, when the Charismatics and the Baptists get together, hey, heaven is coming in. So we, we invite you, when you're in the area, to come and worship with us at any uh, and all of our uh, services. You're always, always Welcome. Just make sure you let me know that you're there. I get a chance to shake your hand and thank you for your support and for coming by. Uh, and if you have not a church home, then you need to consider joining up with your old brother over here. And God will continue to bless all of us. Huh? Somebody says he's going to bless anyhow. Yes, God is in the blessing business. He's here with you, he's here with me, and uh, he is blessing us right now. Hallelujah. I feel a blessing coming down. The name of this offering that we are doing today and have been doing, oh man, I guess a couple of years now, going on year, year two, uh, it's a Reparations broadcast, and it is entitled, It's Time, and the question we always ask is, what is this time for? And the answer, one of the answers is, it's always time for justice. Uh, because uh, environmentally and ecologically, we need uh, justice as black people uh, in America at whatever generational uh, sobriquet or euphemism we have been characterized by or we have characterized ourselves by. Our needs have always been uh, the same. We've been the last hired and the first fired, and then uh, we're the only group that did not immigrate to this country, to this land. And uh, we came here, we were brought here, forced here, kidnapped here uh, against our will. And we had to pay our own ransom, working for the man as slaves for 250 years of unrequited toil. And uh, we are too far behind in the economic wealth gap uh, for us to be saying that we are going to catch up. Yes, we've had uh, our one black president out of uh, 45. We've had one, 44. And now we have a numbskull in his place. That shows you the advantage that white privilege has in this nation and indeed all over this world. Whereas if you were black, you had to be twice as good to get half as much. Uh, if you're white like Donald Trump, all you got to do is be white and have some money. You got the job. And uh, look at what a nincompoop and uh, what an idiot. We go from sugar to you know what. Uh, and I say that very literally too. Uh, however, let me not get off on that right quick. Let's read our scripture for reparations. <laughs> In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, picking up our reading at verse 12, we're going to read on through verse 14. For continuity's sake, this is what the Word of God says in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy being the second telling, the second telling of the law. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, who be thy sister, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then... In the seventh year, thou shalt let him or her go free from thee. And when thou sendest him or her out free from thee, thou shalt not let them go away empty. 
Mark that, please. Thou shalt furnish them liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God has blessed thee, thou shalt give unto them. Now, that in a nutshell is why reparations are justified. Uh, and quite obviously, you can see that if you've been working for free uh, for any length of time, you're falling behind because you're not accumulating uh, any wealth. You're not uh, accumulating any money, any treasure. Everything is going out. Your labor is going out. And your time is going out. And your energy is going out. And nothing is coming back in. It's one thing you know about when you're working, those of you that have worked physically uh, and mentally, that you're going to pay a price after a while for working. You're not going to stay healthy always. You're going to have some what you call industrial uh, injuries. You're going to be like the people at the Pool of Bethesda in Jesus' day, which were a lot of halt uh, and impotent and uh, the like. Everybody who had a... a uh, a uh, industrial injury, have been hurt on the job, have been hurt to the extent that they could no longer work. A lot of them were laying up there at that pool of Bethesda. Uh, but that's common. When you're working, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get injured. If, uh, in the modern day, uh, they tell you you're getting, I forget that term, carpal tunnel, I believe it is, or something to the like. But uh, you understand the risk you run when you're working is that you're going to get what? Hurt on the job, injured on the job. Uh, and all your injuries are not going to be uh, that easily recovered from. I wish I had a witness. So it was in the days of slavery. Uh, and so it was in the days uh, of uh slavery in the Bible, but the difference in the Bible, notice that the person uh, that became or sold themselves to slavery uh, never lost their identity. They never lost their religion. They never lost their culture. They ne never lost their essential personhood uh, as in America, in the Bible Belt, and indeed all over the thirteen co original 13 colonies. Uh, according to Black's uh, Law Dictionary, uh, which was in circulation during the years and the time uh, uh, of Abraham Lincoln when he was studying, so to speak, uh, a slave was defined as a human being who is legally not a person, but a thing. And a quick aside on that, uh, Abe Lincoln said that how long do you think before if they put all of the free uh, Negroes, as we were called then, or slaves, of course, if you're a slave, you're not free, but there were some free Negroes. Uh, if you put all of the, uh, when you put all of the ne free Negroes in slavery, he said, how long do you think it will be before they start pulling all of the poor white, poor white people and reducing them to be things and brutes as well? But of course, I don't want to mix my historical references too much, but I do want to see show the connection and the nexus and the contrast uh, by comparison be between what God uh, ordained in the uh, Bible, uh, what slavery was to be, and how slavery degenerated uh, in the hands of a grievous, a greedy, uh, and a carnal, uh, society. Now, the, remember, back there, it was no democracy, but they still had folks in slavery. Hmm? Think about it. There was no communism, but they still had folks in slavery. Talk to me. Huh? Yeah. There was no parliamentary procedure, but they still had folks in slavery. And that's because of the evil in men's hearts. It has nothing to do with the form of government. People are just evil. And uh, when you read the writings of the founding fathers and you read the uh, bills of sales and the ledgers and the documents that are extant, uh, going all the way back into uh, antiquity, well, 
250 years is really not antiqu antiquity. But uh, going all the way back to the before the founding of the nation, going all the way back to 1619, uh, which this year represents the 400th year uh, of uh, slavery being introduced into the 13th being introduced into the North American continent, uh, recognizing, of course, that the following year, 1620, uh, the Mayflower arrived, and uh, that sometime some years passed it uh, before we got to the uh, 13 colonies. Uh, uniting themselves into a, a what they call a confederacy. And uh, then in 1776, the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, that, the, the version of the Declaration of Independence that was uh, ratified and accepted by the Continental Congress, and uh, 1787 being the year in which the uh, Constitution of the United States uh, itself was uh, formulated, ordained, and established in order to form a more uh, perfect union. But biblically, uh, addressing the issues that are before me, I open up talking about ecological and environmental injustice uh, because of the fact that here in the this latest iteration of what was originally the 13 colonies, uh, as you know, at the time of the uh, Civil War, there were 34 states. Now, uh, as I'm talking to you, there are 50 states. Of course, some people say Israel is our 51st uh, state, but that's another question, another broadcast, another red flag, another red herring. But uh, what happened what we are addressing is the fact are the what inequities and the inequalities uh, that have been uh, perpetrated by the so-called dominant uh, society, the society that considered itself superior, uh, and the way that they have behaved themselves and uh, uh, conducted themselves in that relations, even though they consider themselves to be Christian, uh, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, or what you will, uh, we find that the way that our so-called Christian brothers have, of a lighter hue have created our so-called brothers and sisters of a darker hue is deplorable. And uh, one of the things, one of the ways in which uh, you control the people, you control where they live. Sure, you're going to control where a person lives. Uh, if it's a choice between the high ground and the low ground, you're going to put the people you don't like in the low ground. That way you can uh, dump all of your refuse and your sewage off of the hill and let it run down to the low ground. You don't care because you don't live down there. But the people that are living down there in that in that valley, uh, put at an ecological uh, disadvantage because of the biohazards, quite naturally, that will ensue over time, uh, and uh, the uh, resultant uh, diseases. I always like to uh, honor the work of our sociologists that uh, have labored in the field so industriously and so exhaustively uh, to give us uh, clues and keys and uh, ways of further understanding uh, the, the outcomes that we see among our people and what the causes, what are the genesis, what are the origins uh, of these results and consequences. All we're saying is the consequences. But well, what about what are the causes? And uh, the causes, for the most part, for the really the causes of why we were living in the condition we were living in, is because that you were pushed into those conditions. You were not allowed to live where you wanted. You were allowed to live where you could. And uh, similar to how the uh, so-called American Indian, the Columbus Indians, I always call them were treated, uh, 
that if the Indians were put on a reservation and told to stay in here and don't come out, but then it was later found that there was oil or gold in that reservation, then the people who put the Indians on the reservation would come back and dispossess the Indians, uh, disenfranchise the Indians, put them out, and not gently, and uh, because they wanted to claim the land to get the gold and to get the silver or to get whatever resources uh, may have been. That has happened not just to the uh, so-called uh, Indian, but it also happened to the so-called uh, black people here in the United States of America. Uh, and so a lot of our diseases, a lot of our health conditions, the health outcomes are directly result, direct and indirect results of the history of how we were forced into living conditions that were uh, not optimal, to say the least, and that were not uh, beneficial. Uh, as a matter of fact, they used to just give us the old uh, shitland guts. You could go down to the packing house in the evening on your bicycle or walk over there, and they'd have all those buckets of uh, pig guts and all of that stacked out there. Tell you, they tell you, take it on away from here. They laugh at you, take it on away. They didn't know we were getting fat off it. When they found out we were getting fat off of it, they stopped giving it to us and raised the price. Uh, and that's because we've survived in spite of how we have mistreated. Uh, as Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it uh, for good. And uh, to save a life of great people, a lot of people as it is at this date. We were, therefore, uh, ecologically and environmentally disadvantaged. And the third factor in sociology that uh, is a, uh, what they call a determinant or an influencer, what influences uh, a person from infancy on up, uh, it is, is your personality, and then it is uh, your society, and then it is your environment. So you have those three factors, personality, your society, and your environment. Now, of course, your personality is, is, is the things that, that makes you, you. And, of course, your society, uh, once you come out of the womb, what is your society? What is your immediate society? What is your uh, next your immediate society, would, of course, be the arm, loving arms of your parents, uh, whether you were born to uh, intact what we call mother, father, parents, or uh, a single parent, or whether you were a child of rape, or whether when you were born there was no parent there. His mama, uh, whatever the condition, whether mama died on the in the birth, or mama just walked away after the birth, or gave you away after the birth, uh, that's your society. That's where your society is. And that, of course, the uh, government in which you live, that's, that's part of your society. That's a definite influence. The city, the county, state, and then, of course, the larger uh, federal government. All of those are your society. And what are the laws? What are the rules? You know, what are the codes? Uh, what are the statutes that all of that affects your society? You obey, you ain't got nothing to do with nothing, but you are already impacted and affected because you are born into that environment, that society. Well, I wanted to distinguish between the society and environment in a sense. Uh, but then, of course, like I said, your society, not your environment, of course, uh, is it a hot? Is it cold? Is it pleasant? Is it tropical? Is it rainy? Is it sunny? You know, uh, all of those things 
uh, are your environment? Are you, are you born in a dust bowl? Are you born in a uh, calm, placid, marvelous condition and everything? Uh, all of that environment is going to what? Impact you. Uh, and so and it's, and it's going to be an influence. And that is why it is so vital to me for us to talk about putting Jesus in the equation, putting God and faith and hope. Uh, hope that make it not a shame uh, in the equation to become an influence in your society and in your environment. Uh, because if you know that there is a higher power, a higher God, a higher being, a higher intellect that is likewise available to you beyond the, the uh the uh, the city council desk or the mayor or if you back in back in uh, Chicago the alderman and all of like that uh, if you have knowledge that you have a God on your side that is bigger than all then that too is an influence in your society an influence in your environment and hence it will be an influence in your personality. That's why I believe uh, that we must preach Jesus and him crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected uh, in the context of our environment, in the context of our society. I don't believe we can talk about Jesus absent talking about the situation and the circumstances in which we encounter Jesus. Where you encounter Jesus, whether you encounter him at your local church in the storefront, or whether you have a spiritual experience with him outside and away from any kind of uh, organized uh, type of religion is neither here nor there. It is the point, it is the fact of your awareness that there is a potential greater than you, greater than the president, greater than the king, greater than the governor, greater than the government, greater than your problem that you can appeal to. That's the power of prayer, that we can transcend our condition. That is a great sociological influence. That is a great environmental influence. And yes, it is a great personal uh, influence. And uh, we have to take advantage. I'm trying to preach today. I talk so much about social issues. We have to take advantage of the knowledge that the eternal God, our Father, has made available uh, unto us for our help uh, in ages past and, yes, our very hope for years to come. Now, when I read the modern uh, day uh, journalist Tahanisi Tahani Coates, I, I, I admire his writing. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. I love their writing. One thing I don't like about it is their point of view is that they they do not teach hope. Well, I teach hope. But I preach Christ and Him crucified. I believe and I teach that there is hope. Uh, that there is a God who will come down in Egypt land after 400 years and will bring His people out of Egypt. I teach that there is a God who will bypass, who will drive, who will go past uh, uh, Rome's palace, Palatine Hill, who will go past Herod's uh, Capitoline Hills, and go past uh, uh, Pilate, whoever was uh, in charge when Jesus was born, and instead will come to a poor woman, a poor peasant girl, whoop, down in Bethlehem. Hmm? Down in Nazareth. Go down there where Scripture says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And yet, who come out of Nazareth but the Savior of the world, the hope of the world? And so I never uh, despair of talking about uh, whom I represent. I represent Jesus. And I talk about 
The FHA, I do it in the light of Jesus, my Savior, because he gives us hope. Look at me. Ain't doing too bad. I ain't where I would have been had it not been for white supremacy or racism, but the Lord have, have, have abundantly blessed not only me, but you that's looking at me, God bless you too. Man, give me five minutes. What can I say in five minutes, my brothers and my sisters? Uh, this is no time to uh, lose hope. Uh, the scripture declares, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free or make you free. Now, it's different between being set free and being made free. Uh, emancipation uh, set the slaves free, but the United States military, the army, made them free. Oh, you don't hear me. Uh, the 13th uh, Amendment to the Constitution uh, abolished slavery, whereas the, uh, U the U.S., uh, the Northern Armies, uh, set the slaves free. But uh, the 13th Amendment abolished the very cause of their uh, slavery. Slavery was abolished. You wiped out. Help me. And so uh, we have a God on our side who we need to uh, reach out to. All kinds of uh, metaphysicians have talked about this higher power. I ain't talking about no higher power. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about Jesus. Huh? I ain't talking about some, some you know, boom, 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 boom. Uh, however you want to define it. I give Jesus has a name. He's the Savior of the world. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but by the name Jesus. I don't talk about no recondite. I talk about Jesus. Huh? I don't talk about some anonymous all. I talk about Jesus. That's what I, that's, that is the difference between you, me, and everybody else. You see, everybody wants to deny I don't deny. I don't deny. Uh, as Jesus looked upon the face of mankind, he looked at, at them with open face. He did not deny that Judas was a, was a betrayer. He knew what he was. He loved him anyhow. Gave him a chance anyhow. He knew what the Bible says. Jesus did not need anybody to tell him what was in man, for he knew man, and he loved him anyway. And so uh, we're not walking around with rose-colored glasses when I tell you, uh, brothers and my sisters, about uh, how uh, God can bring you through and God can bring you out and God will bring you through. He will come in your nursing home or your convalescent home or your house. Uh, hallelujah. He'll come in there just like death come in there. Death come in your house and bring sadness. Jesus come in your house and bring joy. Trust him. Believe in him. You got no money in your pocket? Don't go out there and kill nobody. Trust in God. Believe in him. Huh? Tell him, look, man, I'm broke. I ain't got no money. I ain't got no job. Bills are due. Things are bad. What you going to do for me? Hmm? May not come when you want him, but he's going to be right on time. As I close out, uh, everybody say, well, Rev, you're always mad. Hey, when you look at how bad the devil have done us in this country, this land of the free, the home of the brave, whether you were a farmer in the country uh, or whether you were a factory worker in the city, you can't help but get mad. But don't despair. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is still a reproach to any people. And as I look at the world today and look at you and you looking at me, I'm going to tell you one more thing. One more time again. We must have our own uh, enterprise zone. We must start our own businesses. We must start our own uh, efforts to make money. We must not let che people cheat you out your money, whatever color they may be. And remember, if a person wants to get your money away from you, make sure they're going to give you something for your money. If they want your labor from you and they don't want to pay you, take Reverend Martin's advice. Tell them if they don't if they don't want to pay you, what do you do? Don't work for them. Thank you, Doc. We out. Yes, I do. I just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. No, I won't. No, I won't. I won't play.